abandoned mine shaft in the jungle-covered depths of Papua New Guinea. A perfect hiding place for any fanged creature trying to avoid daylight and the glare of science. For biologists Tim Flannery and Lester Siri, this is just another day in the office. Put Sam Bell on your referee, Anna Lester. We can get this one last time. For eight years, these two biologists have been scouring the darkness, turning up a new species here, a new record there. But last year, they made what's perhaps the most amazing discovery of their careers. They discovered a fossil that flew, a living Bulmer's fruit bat, the largest cave-dwelling bat on Earth, twice thought to be extinct and yet only ever studied from bones. I'm here to join them on a return visit to the only known roost in the world. This was to be a journey into a lost world and to a bat cave like no other. the Star Mountains of Papua New Guinea's western province. For centuries, this area has remained remote and inaccessible. Even today, access is difficult without a helicopter. As we fly onwards, we fly upwards, over hidden valleys and hidden rivers, and eventually through the clouds. It reminds me a little bit of that um, a movie I saw as a kid about some explorers who went to South America and found these dinosaurs living on an inaccessible plateau that was up in the air, people couldn't get to it, so the dinosaurs survived there. High on this inaccessible plateau is our destination. A massive limestone doline, a giant hole in the ground with sheer walls sheathed in tenacious vegetation. With the only level ground on the very lip of the cave, landing is uncomfortably tight. Like prey dropped from a mechanical pterodactyl, we're left for two days to discover if our fossil bat still lives. The cave itself is like some impenetrable underworld fortress. Steep walls fall more than 300 metres to its dark and cavernous opening. This yawning chasm behind me goes by the name of Lup Lup Wintem, which means the cave where the fruit bats go inside. If this really is the last safe haven for the Bulma's fruit bat, it's not hard to see why. Lup Lup Wintem must be one of the most inaccessible places on Earth and one of the more dangerous. One more step that way and any bat surviving down there would have a very dead visitor. Bulma's fruit bat is one of those few creatures that was first known from fossils before it was actually known as a living animal. No one thought anything more about it but that it was another one of those Pleistocene things like diprotodons and giant goannas and everything that became extinct at the end of the last ice age. Yeah! No one, that is, but some brave hunters from Bulltem village. It was in the 1970s that an anthropologist accompanied these Wapkaman people on a hunting trip to Lup Lup Wintem. Using vine ropes and bows and arrows, they entered the cave, catching about 300 fresh and definitely unfossilised bats for tea. Bulma's bat had been rediscovered, but almost immediately it came face to face with the 20th century. The Papua New Guinea government started to establish itself, rock teddy mining began exploration, so money came in, uh, shotguns came in, proper rope came in, and people simply entered the cave with nylon ropes and shotguns, and with a single shotgun blast you could kill, I don't know, tens if not hundreds of bats and, and that's exactly what happened. The, the bats were, by 1977 there was only two bats left seen circling the, the roost here and then when people came back through the 80s including myself there was just no sign of the bats at all and we presumed then it had actually really become extinct again. 
and extinct its state until last year. On the 3rd of May 1992, Lester and Tim made one final trek to Lup Lup Wing Tem. Hearing the noise of bats down below, they strung a net high in the trees overhanging the cave. It was about 8 o'clock at night that a bat entered the net and in my great excitement I dropped my torch, fortunately. <laughs> so I had to climb down in the dark, which is quite treacherous in this kind of site. But I had a very angry and large and struggling fruit bat in my hands as well. We finally got to the bottom, I put it in a bag, took the net away from the face and Lester shone his torch on it and we both realised that we saw a face that no one had seen for so long. You never, I don't know anybody in this lifetime would ever have a chance to see a, a 10 to 15 year, uh, 15,000 years uh, a species still alive and I was so excited. A year later, and we're back. There's too much danger involved in entering Lup Lup Wintem for a direct inspection, not least to ourselves. Human intrusion might scare the bats from their one safe refuge. Instead, we set a mist net high above the rim of the cave. The hope is to snare a bat as it slips out of the dolene under the cover of darkness to feed. Yeah, that's good, Lester. It looks great. Though last time they caught only the one bat, Lester and Tim counted 137 in the colony. This time they hope to find an increase in the population. How's it looking? Very, very quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Last time we were here, they were flying around the bottom of the dawning by about quarter to six. So they're obviously quite sensitive to our presence. So. Yeah. OK. So do you think they're going to come out? Oh, yeah, they'll come out, but maybe after dark. Are, th are there any down there, do you think? Yeah, we heard a few. I don't know how many. It's hard to judge. They're being really quiet. With the trap set, a long wait to nightfall begins. In the confusion of a tropical storm, a dark shape, flying lower than the rest, blunders into our trap. I'd love to be able to do that. This is a face that the world has never seen. A flesh and blood gargoyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now let's see if she's given birth yet. The nipples are down there, you see, and there's no sign that, uh, that she's located at all. So she's a first year female. Okay. Probably born about um, April last year. Despite the complaints, she's in caring hands. Yeah, yeah, it is. And see those teeth, the most peculiar teeth, really without any incisors, nothing at the front to grasp. Yeah, yeah. Food with just the canines. Poor thing, I know. You let me go in about half a second, just to relax. Nice big eyes. Beautiful big eyes. Beautiful big eyes. This is the land that time forgot. Like an island hidden high in the clouds. A surprisingly cool, temperate climate, cocooned in the rich moistness of the tropics. Concealed amongst the greenery are biological relics from the ancient supercontinent, Gondwana. Cinnamon and blueberries, podocarps and chefflerias. Relics from when Australia, Antarctica and South America were one. But is Bulmer's bat a hanger-on from this bygone age that has no real function in the present day? Or is it an important nocturnal cog in the workings of this entire ancient forest? Lester and I have finished a survey of the mammals of this region and in an area about as big as suburban Sydney, we've found 130 mammal species, which is about half the total mammal fauna of Australia. It's an enormous fauna. And that diversity occurs in every other group we want to look at, the fish in the river, the trees. It's just one of those hot spots. And, and for Australasia, the old Australian landmass, this is it. This is the highest diversity that you'll see anywhere. So it's extraordinarily important. And Bulma's fruit bat is probably a keystone species in that diversity. It's got a very unusual dentition, um, very unusual 
lips. It's presumably got some unusual feeding habit, and being a fruit bat, it'll eat fruit and pollen. So it's probably a, a, probably a pollinator of many of the trees here. It's probably a, a disperser of the fruit. It may be the only disperser of the fruit for some tree species. So we need to learn about that. Last year's count of 137 bats flying out has risen slightly to 151. But numbers are not going up as fast as they should. There must be some villages around here where people are hunting bats and, and a small proportion of that take as Bulma's fruit bat. If that proportion goes up, the tiny increase we've seen this year could easily turn into a decrease again and we could lose the species very, very easily. We are faced in this uh, country with the, uh, with the problem of, you know, uh, people within the country dependent on a lot of the species that uh, we, want, we want to conserve. We can, I, I believe we, we, we are able to uh, tell, uh, talk to the people, let them know where, at what time and how much they can actually uh, uh, get hold of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the boomers would bet and not to take them out just for the sake of killing one of them for food. It is, actually. It's the, the ears are like those pinkish tips. It's another subadult female. If we lose Bulma's fruit bat, we may not just be losing 150 bats. We may be losing many or several of the species of trees in this forest, the possums that only eat the leaves of those trees, um, the insects that only live in the canopy of those trees. You start a decline. And maybe, maybe part of the re reason this area is so diverse is that species like Bulma's fruit bat have survived here in this you know, area of low population density and very rough topography. That, that ear measurement is near enough to 31, less than not 28. Yeah, it's just about time that this little girl go back to the cave, eh? Yes, sir, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's right, he's got, he's got it now. Good. Oh, one leg, yeah. Good he's just about to take off, I think. So there he goes. He goes. Less than 20 years ago, perhaps 10,000 bats lived here. The Wapkaman people tell of the deafening roar and the ground that shook every time they left the roost. We leave the bats in peace. Our hope that our deafening roar won't be the last to reverberate around the walls of Lup Lup Wintem. <laughs> <laughs>